Hello friends and thank you for joining me for another tutorial working with C-Sharp and databases. This is part 4. In this session we'll go over SQL types and type datasets, um, how to perform bulk operation, how to insert data into SQL and ensure that it succeeds and if it fails to roll back. And so far we have primarily been working with SQL client uh, connecting to SQL server um, but we can use the SQL client factory to create a SQL client that we can connect with other databases uh, like Oracle client, MySQL client, uh, and also SQLite using ADO.NET. All right, let's get started. So here we have a project from our part two of ADO.NET. And basically what we're doing is we're connecting to a SQL server and running a command uh, to get the results. But what we're also doing is once we get the results into a data reader, uh, we're asking for the schema for this query that we just ran and putting that into a data table. And so let's go ahead and run this real quick. So here we now have the schema. And if we actually go to view the results of this, and let's maximize that. And here's all of the columns. And over here, we have all of the data types that maps to our C sharp code, which is nth strings date time. And we have some bytes over here as well, which is a binary uh, data, which is the employee's photo. And if we continue to scroll this way, now we're going to see the provider specific data types. These are the SQL data types. So the mapping of N32 is to SQL N32 and the string uh, to SQL string and so forth. So if we go to our database and let's go ahead and open one of the tables and let's choose uh, employees. And in here you can see that we have integer values uh, in var char and date time and or photo, we have an image, which is a binary, and we have some notes, which is n text, and so forth. So all of this is represented in our example here. And that is basically, this is the types that are being used. So now let's create a quick example on how to use these uh, data types. So in this example, um, we have a data table and we've added some columns and we also are using the SQL uh, types in here so this is the int string date time binary and string again now there's a couple of things you have to reference the system.data.sql client in order to get the connection builder the SQL connection command and such and you need to reference the system.data.sql types in order to get the types that are listed here. Next, um, we're creating a connection string to our SQL server and we're then making a connection and then we are creating a command and then we are opening our connection and then getting the data in a SQL uh, data reader and then we're getting the data type or excuse me the schema and then we are loading the reader into the data table. So let's go ahead and run this program. Um, so we got an exception. The exception is source column photo of bytes and the data column photos of SQL binary um, is invalid. So I have created a case for the .NET team. I believe that this is a bug in the system. Um, so hopefully we'll figure out um, if this is a bug or maybe I'm misusing the .NET objects. Now, to get around this, um, there is a workaround. And basically what we have to do is instead of using SQL uh, binary, uh, we're going to use the byte array. And this time, if we run the program, we indeed get our data table that has our information. So this brings up a question. How do you read binary images from your SQL server and how do you get the data into the database? 
Uh, one of the recommendation is to not use the SQL database as a storage for files, but it does give you some benefits. So the pros and cons are this. If all your data is there and you're storing images or PDF documents inside a database, uh, you have the benefit of having everything centralized in your database. Unfortunately, the side effect is that your database is going to grow based on the file sizes of the images, PDFs, or other documents that you may have. So the, the downside is that the data is in SQL. In order to retrieve the images, you have to make a connection to SQL to get that from the database. So there's pros and cons. If you want to save the images or documents, you can. Um, and just remember the differences between the two and make a decision that's going to fit best to your needs. So let's go ahead and figure out how we can actually insert the uh, binary images uh, into our database. Now, if you didn't want to use the types that are within SQL, you could actually comment these out. And let's go ahead and uncomment the native C-sharp um, values. And this should also work without any issues. So if you're not sure about the data type to use, if you're going down to using the um, SQL types, then get the schema and go to the data table and look at the mapping that happens between the .NET and the provided specific data types. So in this example, we're going to show you how to insert data into SQL Server using images, uh, but this could be PDF or any other document that you may have. You just have to read it as a uh, file stream into bytes and then put it into your database. So what we're going to do is, again, in the beginning, we're going to put data into the database. Then we're going to read the data out uh, and then save it into a file. So this should give you an example of how to insert and retrieve data uh, as images or other documents into SQL Server. So here we have a uh, Hello World JPEG file. And if we were to open this, this is just a very simple image uh, that we have. And this image was set up so that when we go to the properties, it's going to always copy this when the application is compiled into the bin directory. So if you if we were to compile it, then you'll see the image uh, uh, inserted into the bin directory. And the reason you're able to see the uh, hidden folders are is that we have enabled that in Visual Studio. So let's go over the program. Here we're just creating a connection string and have a method that gets the connection uh, object. So if we go in here, it's just a simple uh, connection builder that we built and gets the connection string and puts it into our variable. Next, we have the file stream. And this stream is going to read the hello world uh, JPEG, the JPEG, and it's going to use the file mode open and the access is going to be read. And that's going to read this file, which is um, our file over here. The reason it doesn't have a path is that the file gets saved into the bin directory because this is uh, this code is being executed in the same uh, position as the hello world. So it was it's going to uh, find it in that folder rather than having a C colon a backslash and a certain path. So now that we read the uh, file into a stream, we put that into a binary reader. So the stream goes into the binary reader. Now we can access the uh, stream using the reader. Next, what we do is read all the bytes uh, to the length of the stream uh, into a variable, which is going to be in bytes. Then we go ahead and close the reader and close our stream. Next, we create our connection object, and then we create our command object and have a simple insert into the database. And one of those is going to be our photo. This is where the uh, binary data is going to go. Next, uh, we create a command parameters, uh, and this is basically these values that are uh, over here. And each one will have a string uh, associated with it, where date and time as well. And in here, we also have our photo, which is the uh, byte array that we had up above. 
and this is the SQL uh, data type of image for the parameter. Then we open our connection and then we execute our query. Because it's a non-query, uh, we don't actually want the return value, although you could use it and if it was greater than zero, meaning that uh, more than one object was updated or inserted into the database, then you could do something with it. Um, but we know that this is going to succeed, hopefully. Uh, so for this example, we're just not going to worry about that. So let's go ahead and put a breakpoint here and execute this piece of code. So now that we're here, um, if we were to go now look in the bin directory, we should see our image. And there's our image over here. So if we were to go to our database, uh, and if I was to refresh this, we should see a record in here. And there's our record over here, and there's our binary data. So now if we were to execute the rest of the code, we should retrieve that data from the database, but we're going to name it into a different file to see how we can extract that uh, object back. So here we have our SQL connection. We have a very simple select statement into our command. Uh, we're reading all of the employee's data. You could have a where clause where ID is equal to a certain value, but for this example, we're just going to do it this way. We open our connection when then we execute the command as a reader. And now we have our reader and we do a loop because we, we know that it's going to return multiple records. And while the read is true, uh, we do some logic. And this logic, we basically are saying that the go to the SQL data reader, get the string from index zero. That's going to be the index of the select statement uh, columns. And that's going to be zero, one, two, three, four. So last name is what we want. If that string is equal to our string, then we go inside of this code here. Next, we create a buffer size of 100. Um, you could have this bigger than 100 if you wanted to. We just use a 100 arbitrary number. Next, we use the buffer bytes. This is where the data is going to get stored. So using the 100, so in chunks of 100 is what we want. And the data index, this is the position where it's going to start from and then read up to 100. So next, we create a file stream again. This time, we're going to name it differently. And then we're going to have the file mode as open or create, meaning that if the file exists, open it. If it does not, go ahead and create it. And then the file access is going to be right because we're going to be writing to this file. Then we take the stream and in order to write to the stream, we need a binary writer. So we create a binary writer passing our stream into it. Next, what we do is actually call the reader to get the bytes. And we are asking for the index of four which is the photo, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, next, this is going to be from where the buffer is going to start. So because this is our first uh, index, it's going to be 0. And then the buffer is going to be this value that's going to stuff it into. And then um, we actually have the uh, buffer index. And then we have the uh, buffer size, which is 100. So the SQL data reader get bytes is going to return a return value and this return value is going to be the actual bytes read um, when passing these values and we're only going to loop when the return value and the buffer size is equal if we are the end of the stream and uh, we'll probably be reading less than 100 and if it is, then we uh, or we know that we are at the end of the stream, and so we'll get out. So this is why we're uh, looking for uh, return value and buffer size being equal. The next thing that we want to do is we want to then write into the uh, writer using the buffer. So because we read the first 100 chunks into the buffer, that's why we write it here, and then we flush it. Next, we want to increment our data index. So the first time we came here, this was zero. Now we have in the second time, we want this to be plus the buffer size because we're going to read in chunks of hundreds. So now it's going to be a hundred. Now we actually call the same exact code that we had above, but with the index being incremented, but the rest being the same because we're reading chunks of hundred into this buffer. 
and as we come back into the loop we're going to be keep writing it and once this loop is ended uh, we go ahead and close our uh, writer and we break out of the uh, while and that should actually write our new file as hello world.jpg so if we go ahead and continue this program now and now that it succeeded let's go into our folder where bin directory is and here is the image that we read from the database and rewrote it into hello world.jpg file so this is an example of how to read data from SQL Server and binary, meaning file-based, um, and how to insert it and how to retrieve it from the database. Something to note is that the SQL data type of image and uh, upcoming version of SQL Server is not going to be supported. So there's this article documentation for SQL Server that in text, text, and image is not going to be supported and so what do you use uh, instead uh, instead if you're inserting documents uh, or any files uh, you should be using the var binary uh, of max instead of the image or um, anything else so uh, and then there's some documentation here um, for that as well SQL Server also supports file stream data and so here's the documentation for that you can do a quick search and then if you come down here uh, it will show you how to create a um, this column var binary max as a file stream um, and if you do you need to have a unique row identifier we're not going to go over this because this is more related to sql server uh, at some point we'll do tutorials for sql server that we can go over these uh, in the upcoming uh, versions of uh, our sessions that we do. So there's some documentation here as well on how to then read that information um, as well as uh, other documents here. So if you come into the file stream for SQL Server, um, make sure you talk to your DBAs because there are uh, some things you need to do to prepare your database for that. Um, if you wanna go down this route, um, it's pretty simple. Just some configuration values you need to set. Uh, and then once the database is prepared, then you can go ahead and read um, those uh, files and write to your database. And so make sure you read these documentation. Okay, so this should be um, enough to get you going for reading and writing images to the database or any file types. Okay, so now let's go over how to use the var binary data type in SQL Server. Here we've created a simple uh, SQL script which will create a table and in this table we will have the exact columns with employee ID and photo and having a var binary instead of an image. This is the supported way of storing binary data. So let's go ahead and copy this and go to our SQL server and let's go ahead and execute our program and if we refresh now we should see our new table. Let's go ahead and also select everything. And as you can see, there's nothing there. Um, and if we will go look at the code, it's exactly the same thing as we did before. Uh, the only difference is that, of course, we have a different insert statement as well as a select statement. And we're using the var binary, but we're reading the photo uh, exactly the same as before uh, with the hello world JPEG. But this time when we save it, we're actually saving it into hello world var binary. Uh, again, this logic hasn't changed. It's exactly the same thing. So let's go ahead and execute this. Okay, so now that it's done, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at our database. We should now have one record in here. We do, and there's our binary data. And now if we go to where our data is stored, uh, you'll notice that we have a new file called hello world underscore var binary. And as you can see, the image is there. So we were able to save the data as well as retrieve it uh, just using the same code as before. Now, again, as we mentioned uh, previously, uh, there is another option and that's to use a file stream data. And we quickly went over it. Um, and if we look over here and our SQL, we do have 
uh, the code to where it's going to create that table for us, but instead it's using the file stream. If you were to run this code, it would not work by default. And the reason for that is because you have to do some configuration to your database. So here, it's, there's some documentation that we've you've already seen before uh, that we talked about and gives you some information. You would have to talk to your DBA to go ahead and figure out how to enable those options in order for you to be able to use the file stream. So I'll quickly go over it because I don't want to um, just talk about this and just leave it for you. Uh, so if you go to the first link, it's how to enable the file stream. And this one is pretty easy. This actually enables the server configuration. Um, and so all you have to do is run this piece of code and this will allow the uh, file stream access to your server. So if you will go to the server and then you right click and you go to properties, you'll uh, see some advanced options. And in here, uh, we should have the file stream, uh, which is disabled. But if you were to enable this, you have some options and how you want to do that. And that's basically what that SQL statement is doing. It is setting those options for you. And then there's some best practices on how to uh, do that. Next, you want to, so now that you enable this on a server, next you need to do is set up your database. So if you come in over here and when you're creating a database, so you have an additional uh, value here for the file stream. Uh, generally, when you create a database, there are two files, the MDF and LDF. The LDF is the log file. The MDF is the actual data where it will be stored. So as you're working with a database, all the data will be logged in the log file. And then over time, it will get persisted into the database. So if we were to go over here and look at our Northwind database, and if we were to look at the files, um, you'll notice that we have our data file and log file. Now, the reason um, the you'll see the path this way instead of C colon is that this is in our Docker container, uh, so which is on Linux. So this is SQL Server running on Linux. So once you enable this file stream, the next thing you need to do is actually create the table. So if you come over here, then there's the SQL statement for you to create the database table. And once you have all these options, you can then use the SQL statement to create this and then have the code to be able to access the um, file stream uh, and grab your basically documents. So that code is actually in here. Uh, so just um, uh, I'll provide a link into the description so that you can go in there and um, take a look at this example that's over here for you. Okay, so that's it for now. Let's have a talk about type data sets. So what's a type data set? Um, generally, when you want to have control over the data in the data set, you would actually create a class and then you would inherit from the data set and then you can interact with the data set object through your class. Um, a good example would be is that if we actually went through Visual Studio tools and create a type data set. Now Visual Studio um, uses the .NET framework, so it's going to be referencing and working with the system DLLs um, that are specific to .NET framework, but the code that it generates should work in .NET Core. Uh, again, if you run into issues, uh, so you'll have to manually go there and see if you can fix the automated code. Um, now, how do you create that? Well, you can go to your project, right click on it and say add and then say new item. In the new item, you'll have a list of all of the um, items within Visual Studio you could use or the Visual C Sharp. And one of them is data. So if you come in here, um, this is all of the uh, items that you can create and one of them is the data set. So here, let's just call this Northwind and click add. So all this is going to do is create a XSD and in XSD we have the designer that supports that and then we have this XSC and XSS. Okay, the Visual Studio Designer will automatically have the XSD opened up and we can actually go to the Server Explorer and here I've already attached to my 
SQL Server. If you had not, what you can do is delete this and click Add Connection. Here you want to choose SQL Server because we're connecting to a server. Click OK. And then on my server name, uh, mine is my Docker is running locally, so I'm going to say localhost. And we're going to go ahead and use SQL Authentication, SA, and put a password in here. So the password that I'm going to put, uh, I'm going to have to go to my Docker container to see what the password is. Let's just go inside of this, click Inspect. And there's the password, so we're going to go ahead and copy that. And we're going to say, allow save my password. And then we're going to choose the Northland database. Click OK. What this is going to do is create a data connection for us to our SQL Server. And then we can go to our tables and select all of them. And then drag and drop to our Northland.xsd. What Visual Studio is doing is it's going to read all of our tables, the references, the columns, primary keys, um, pretty much everything that you have within your tables, and create a structure for you. So let's just give it a few seconds. So this may take a while, depending on how many tables you're bringing in and how many references and other objects and columns are, are in your tables. So now you're going to get this um, warning or information, I should say, that the connection string used by these uh, objects contains certain information because we have our password uh, in there and it's as SA. So are you sure you want to add this to the data set and plain text? We're going to say yes for now. And so what Visual Studio went and is doing for us is we're creating all of these tables for us. So let's go ahead and kind of rearrange these a little bit so we can see it a little bit better. And notice now that we have the categories, and if we go to the categories table, we have all the columns in there, and then we also have this method that says fill get data. If we right click on this and click preview data, we actually see the XSD we have and the method, and if we click preview, it actually goes and gets our data. It even brings up the pictures and it should allow to display it for you. So how is it that it's actually calling this method for us? How does it know the connection string and all everything else? Well, the connection string is getting saved. So what happened was that Visual Studio went to this uh, designer uh, code behind that we have and generated the files for us. This namespace is uh, a little bit off, so let's go ahead and fix this. Just call it the .net, uh, tutorial. And if you can see, there's all our tables, and it has a bunch of information over here. So let's go ahead and do a quick search for data source. So now you can see that it is, when it's initializing the connection string, it actually has our connection string in here. So when we were in XSD and we filled the data, it used this connection string for us to initialize. Now, how does this help us with the code? So let's go ahead and save this information. We'll keep this open for now. So what we're going to do is we're going to write some code that's going to be able to allow us to use our Northwind um, strongly typed database. So we need to have a namespace. So now let's go ahead and use our ADO.NET tutorial. And then we're going to go ahead and use the Northwind object, which is our type data set. So now that we have this, we can actually start accessing its properties and methods. Um, so the one that we want is actually the categories. But if we were to access the categories, this categories would be empty. So how do we go populate this? Let's go ahead and comment that for now. So the next thing we need to do is we need to create the categories 
cable adapter. Now to do that, we need a new uh, namespace here. So we're just going to say adio.net dot not one table adapters. So now we can access the categories table adapter. Let's go ahead and get some more real estate here. So now that we have the adapter, we need to access the uh, get data basically. And to do that, uh, we would just basically have our categories adapter and call the get data. Now this is going to return a data table, the categories data table, which we can assign to Northwind dot categories data table. So we need to now have a variable for this categories. And now that we have the actual data, how do we have put this data into the categories? So to do that, we need to get the uh, categories adapter, the variable, and use the fill method. And then to fill it, we need to have the data table we want to fill, which will be our Northwind categories. Now let's go ahead and run this. And now that is done, we can go to our Northwind objects. We can click view. This should show all of the categories, but if you had filled in the other tables, you would have access to that as well. So this makes it pretty easy to be able to fill um, pretty much anything you want. Uh, and you have the uh, adapter in here as well so that you can actually make changes and then save that. But the problem is, is that we save that connection string and this works fine in our scenario but when you go to production, how do you actually uh, submit a new connection string or go to the XSD and make sure that we don't have the connection string saved in there. So we'll do that next. So before setting up the connection string so we can use our own connection string rather than the one hard-coded in the Northwind Designer.cs, we need to kind of understand the code that was generated here, what the methods are and everything. And right now, because this is auto-generated, it uh, looks a little bit complex and you're probably not going to be able to understand some of this stuff. To make it easier, uh, if you're like me and you like something more visual, then what we want to do is we want to see it uh, visually so we can see all the methods, uh, properties, and uh, values that are, are in this class. So if we go to our view in uh, Visual Studio, uh, there are two sections here. There's the class view. Um, and then there's the object browser. So we'll go with the object browser first. This will bring up the uh, object browser. So it's gonna show you all of the assemblies that are here, but it will also show our project here. And if we navigate to our project and now we can see the namespace that we have. Um, and then of course there's our Northman database. And these are all the methods that are associated with this uh, class. So we can see our, the properties and what the return values are. And so these are all of the tables that are being represented. And these are now in a dotted notation, meaning that um, if we were to do northwind dot, you can get the categories. We don't have to do it um, in the old way. If you just had a data set, um, you would basically say um, tables and then um, you would have to give the table name, uh, which would be categories, and then you would get it. So this would be considered a weekly type, uh, where you have to, um, uh, go, you're accessing it through some array, um, whereas in this is considered strongly typed, uh, where you now actually will do dot categories and it will know exactly which table to go get this information from. So now that we uh, looked at the object browser and how you can look at all of the classes and its properties and methods, the other way to look at this, if we go to view and you can go to class view. Now the class view is a little bit different because it will only show you your project, whereas in the object browser shows you pretty much 
all assemblies, including your projects. So here now we can see the same information. And if we go to our ADO.NET tutorial and Northwind database, and then over here, let's get some more real estate here. And you can see all of the methods that are associated with this class, which is pretty much the same thing you saw here. So you could move this out here so you can get more uh, space. Let's go ahead and do that. And now you can see all of the properties and you have some additional information that's given to you when you select one of these uh, methods and properties. So you can decide now which one to use. So if we go to our uh, ADO editorial, um, notice that now we have the Northwind database, but also we have another namespace that we were using, which was the uh, table adapters. Uh, these are the adapters that are responsible for getting the data and filling everything for you. So we use the categories table adapter. So if we go over here, um, you notice we use the categories uh, table adapter. And in here, we call get data. And if we go to the get data, it's going to, uh, first of all, what it's doing is um, it's accessing a select command, which is the first collection in the command collection. And we'll go ahead and take a look at that. So this is basically an array of SQL commands. And that's being initialized uh, in the init uh, collection. So if we go to see that, so the command collection zero is by default is setting our select statement. And that is why we're getting the collection zero of this array and assigning it to the adapter select command. And then after that, we initialize categories data table. And then we go to our adapter to fill this. So if we were to go to our adapter now, the adapter has a initializer, init adapter. And if we were to go to this, now in here, um, you'll see that we are setting all of the properties. Um, this is the categories table, and we are setting all the column mappings. If your database table versus the um, data set table uh, column name was different, um, you would have this uh, mapping associated here. And notice now that we have uh, the delete command, but we have our delete statement, insert statement, and we have update. So we have all four CRUD operations here, and the zero collection was the select statement. So now that we have initialized the adapter, then where is the connection uh, object is setting getting set? So all of the, the delete command, the insert command, all of them are being set by the connection object. So if we go to the connection object, the property has a getter and a setter. In the getter, um, we check to see if the connection is null. If it is, we do initialization. And if we go to the initialization, this is where the connection string is being set. But we also have a setter, meaning that we can set our own connection and it's going to set it for the insert, delete, update, and the command collection uh, zero as well, because it's going to go iterate through all of them. And then when we actually try to get this, it would, the connection object will not be null. Therefore, it will use our connection object. So now let's go ahead and go to our... So what we need to do is we need to go find the connection string that's being initialized for all of these uh, tables and delete them. And then after we delete them, we're going to go ahead and programmatically assign the connection string. So let's go ahead and search for data source, which will basically give us the location for the connection string. And what we can do is we'll just go ahead and set this to null. And we'll do that for all of them. Now, remember when we went through the wizard, 
we actually asked for the connection string to be safe and that's why we had that and this is why we're setting everything to null when you go through the wizard then you don't have to set it and it will will not have a connection string here so you don't have to go through this cleanup that I just did. And now to test this, we need to make sure that this doesn't actually fill or have a connection that we forgot. This should actually error out. So let's go ahead and run that. And sure enough, the connection string has not been initialized. It is failing. That's good. So next, we just need to set the connection. Okay, so now let's go ahead and run this. And if we go to our Northwind data set, we can see that we have the same data coming back, but this time we're choosing our own connection string. So now let's go over how you can insert bulk data into SQL Server using ADO.net. Uh, you can definitely use uh, SQL commands like BCP, um, the SSIS packages and other forms to upload bulk operations. But if you choose to do it through C Sharp and ADO.NET, that is an option. And there's a command, um, there's a class actually, that will do the bulk copy for you. So here I have a piece of command, and um, what we did was to set this up. Uh, we're going to go ahead and update the uh, customers by inserting bulk operation and running just the select statement and selecting just the first two records. You can actually control C, copy that, and then go to a editor and go ahead and paste that. What you will get is the two records as well as all of the columns. And let's go ahead and delete the columns and then you can save this into your hard drive as a text file now the customer id is unique so it's five characters so we're just going to head and have all a's in here and then for this one we'll just have all b's at least that's what i did the other thing to note is that there is a tab that separates the columns so if you're going to import this it would have to be tab based. Now we've already created this record. When you copy from SQL Server like that, um, you will notice that the uh, null records are coming up as strings. So you're gonna have to delete this. So that way when you're inserting it, there is nothing to insert either blank or null record. So let's go ahead and undo that. So here's the record and it has the um, unique customer IDs, but that's, the rest of the records are the same. So something else to note is, how do you know these are tabs versus spaces? Um, there is a option, so if you go to edit and you go to advanced and say, um, select the uh, view white spaces, um, you'll notice that spaces are uh, shown as the uh, period in between, or a dot actually, and then the tabs are basically an arrow. Now if I was to tab this again, um, you'll note that there's two tabs in here. So if I backspace, it'll delete it for us. So next, let's go over the code that's going to do the import for us. So we have our connection string, and then now we have a select statement. This select is star from the customer where one is not equal to one. The reason we did this was because we want a select statement with no records coming back. And we'll explain why we did that in a second. Next, we create our SQL connection, passing our connection string. We create a command having the uh, select statement of the address in there. Then we open our connection. Then we call the execute on the SQL command and get a reader. Next, we get the schema from our SQL reader. Then we create this table. The table is basically being dynamically generated based on the schema. So we iterate through the schema rows by picking the first row, and that's going to be the column name. And this 12th row, which is actually the 13th because we're uh, array and zero based. So we actually gives us the string representation of the 
C sharp type that's going to be used and we just go ahead and get that type that get type passing the string and that's going to give us the type of the column that is going to be so this will generate a table for us with the correct column name and data type you could do some advanced stuff in here as well by looking at that schema table if you wanted to make this more functional uh, for example if you wanted to have precisions between uh, the number of characters in the string and so forth, you could actually do that as well. So next, we take that reader and load it into our table that has all our columns created based on the schema from this reader. Now that we have the table, what we do is we go ahead and read the customer's text file. And what we also did was to go here and update this so that do all these copies so that when we are building the application it will go into the bin directory that is why we have no path in here so we read all the lines and read the lines one record at a time and then we're going to go ahead and split that using the tab so this is going to return as an array and then we create a new row which is a data row and we iterate through the columns array that we have and add those because this is going to be uh, the correct indexes will be there and we just keep propagating the column values into the data row and once that is completed we add the data row into our table so let's go ahead and do this uh, one record at a time before we actually do the bulk copy so we'll go ahead and put a breakpoint here let's go ahead and run our program Okay, so now we have our schema. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. So the index of 0 has our column names, and we said that the index of 12, so that'll be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, which is the data type that gives us the data type that we're supposed to have, which is all strings. And now we go through and generate that data table. So now if we view this, there will be no records in there, of course, but we have our columns created for us. So next, let's go ahead and put a breakpoint here. So if we continue, now we're going to read all the lines. So if you look at this, this is our first line and we split that with a tab and we get our 11 records from the customer ID and all the rest. Now this one is null uh, or empty so that will be an empty record in the database and we iterate now one record at a time and update our data row. So now that we have our data row and we look at the item array of it, it is populated correctly with all of the values and we add that to our table. So now if we look at the table, we have our two records with the customer ID of all five A's and all five B's. So next we create a SQL bulk copy class passing our connection string and we tell it the destination table name, which is going to be dbo.customers. And then we actually call the method write to server passing our database table. And that should enter the records into our database. So if we were to go to our SQL server and look at the records that we do have in here, there are no A's and B's in here at all. And the number of rows being returned is 91 over here. Let's go ahead and run our program. So if we had any error messages that we've written to the console, let's go take a look if we have, there's no errors. And if we rerun our program, we now have 93 records, so there was two records added. Here's our first record, and here's our second record. So that is how you can use the bulk operation using um, ADO.net couple of things to be aware of. Now, when you're reading a file like this with all lines, it's going to read it in memory. 
if you have a very large file of gigs of uh, lines in there, what will happen is that it's going to consume memory. So if you're going to run this on a server, make sure that you have enough memory to be able to, to process this data bulk operation. If you do not, then what you have to do is break your um, file into multiple files so that you can do this and operation. Another thing you can do is read this as a stream. So that way you can read a um, number of uh, reads from the stream uh, so that we can read only chunks of the file and then read those lines and then insert those into the database. So in this example, we'll go over SQL transactions. And SQL transactions basically allows you to insert your record into the database, making sure that it persists if there's no exceptions. If there are any exceptions, then we should roll back the transactions so that we don't have stale data in the database. So in this example, we have two queries and they're inserting to the region table. Um, so if we go look at our region table, we just have some region IDs and some descriptions and we're inserting these two, but what we're doing is we're creating a transaction and wrapping this around that. On this first example, so let's go through line by line and see what we're doing. We're creating our connection string. We're creating a SQL connection using the connection string. We open our connection. Next, we create a SQL command. And then we have the begin transaction off of the connection that we created up above. And we name this transaction something. It could be anything. So we create a transaction. Then in the command, we pass the connection so that the command knows which, which SQL connection to use to execute these uh, insert statements. The command also has a transaction, which we set the transaction that we created up here. Then in the command, we set our insert statement and then we call the execute non-query. Then we have the second command and we have a second insert and then we call the execute non-query again. And then we have to throw an exception. If we didn't have this exception, then we would commit this and both records would persist in the database. If now that we are having a transaction, we should catch that we output the message then we do another try catch for rolling back the transaction when we roll back the transaction the records will not persist and it would be as if we never inserted anything to the database something to keep in mind that when you're creating transaction there is some locking that happens in sql and we'll see that in a second so let's go ahead and actually put a breakpoint on this um, exception before we throw it to see what happens in the database when we are inserting this. So let's go ahead and start this. So here we've executed both our commands and now if we go to SQL and run this you'll notice that the execution is just hanging and that's because the transaction locked the table because there's so many few rows here and now if we continue so we catch the exception, we output the message, and then now we roll back transaction. The minute we roll back, it will unlock the table and we can see the records and as you can see there's no records inserted. And then we are done. So let's go ahead and comment this exception. And this time, if we run it, there will be no exception, of course. And then we do the commit and that's pretty much, it's gonna persist our records in the database. Let's go ahead and run this. Okay, both records are written to the database. Let's go check that. As you can see, both records are inserted into the database. So when you're doing transactions, make sure that you always have a try catch. So the commit should be inside of one try catch. And then if there's any exceptions, of course, then we try to do the rollback, but the rollback will be inside of another try catch. And the reason for that is that there could be issues when you try to roll back because if you're committing this and there's an issue and SQL tries to roll it back, you can't really roll back the transaction because SQL already did it for you and this would throw an exception. And then you can catch that second exception here and you can output the message or log it somewhere. So that's basically how you do the transactions with SQL.
And so next, let's look into SQL Client Factory. So in this example, uh, we've got code that shows how to use the SQL Client Factory. And I guess the first thing is to kind of ask, well, what is a SQL Client Factory? And now before we talk about that, let's kind of uh, figure out some basics and talk about the factory pattern, right? So in software development, there are many patterns and basically they are patterns or cookie cutter solutions to help you create software that's reusable and easy to use. Factory pattern falls under object creation. That's how it's grouped. We don't have to worry about how to create the object. We just pass it some values and the factory will create the object for us and we can use it as we see fit. Now let's answer the question why SQL client has a factory. So Microsoft wanted to create some data access objects so that you could use to access your data store. In our example, we've been using SQL Server. But what if tomorrow you decided you wanted to use another database like Oracle, MySQL, or even SQLite? Do you have to learn a whole new bunch of APIs specific to that data store? Uh, the answer is no. You want to be able to use something that you've already know how to use and how to work. So Microsoft created data providers. And we've been using the data provider for SQL. And just as you learn that you use, let's say, SQL connection, SQL command, SQL data reader, similar objects exist in other data stores like Oracle client or MySQL client or SQLite client. And that's why they have factories so that you can access the data in a similar fashion. So if you look at this example, let's uh, go ahead and actually uh, not talk about this just yet. Um, if you look, we have a connection. We have a connection string. We open our connection. We create a command. So now we have a command. And then we have our T-SQL associated to the command. And we execute a reader from the command. And then we have a data table that we load when we get, and then we get objects for it. So we didn't have to learn anything new. Um, we just can call any uh, like Oracle, MySQL, or SQLite and still use the same knowledge we had before. And this is why you have the SQL client data provider. Now, how did Microsoft do this? So if we go look at um, some examples, um, here we have actually the SQL data reader. Um, and if you look at this, they're inheriting from a class called DB data reader. Right? And if we go to, let's say, for example, uh, the SQL command, the SQL command inherits from the DB command. And if we go back to DB, the SQL connection, it is DB connection. So all you have to do is create your own class um, and then inherit from this DB connection or anything DB like command or DB data reader. And then once you implement these, um, the implementation and override the uh, methods and objects that it has, then you can use it and then just pass the DB connection object and everything should work just as is. Now, before we set this uh, example up, we should kind of go over a couple of things. Uh, we use the software, uh, we're going to be, for this example, we're going to use SQLite. And so for SQLite, um, I have this UI tool called the DB browser for SQLite. I'll put a link in the description where you can get it, but you can always Google this and you'll find it. And this tool is basically a visual way, similar to we have our SQL uh, Server Studio. Uh, it's a similar way to create uh, databases or open existing SQLite database. So if we click new, um, it will give us a uh, file name. Uh, for this, we won't do anything. We already have one. So if we click open and we go to, um, so here we have a table called region. It has a region ID and then it has a description. It's integer and this one is text. You can also have views, triggers and indexes and such. Uh, but for this, we just have this. Now, if you wanted to view the, um, you can say browse, uh, and now you can see the actual data that's stored in there. Um, you can also modify this table and notice that the commands that you use to create the table is very similar, but not quite. 
um, there are some differences and of course that's because this is a uh, different data store and you can actually come in here and you can add stuff uh, columns and um, and you'll see the SQL side of it T SQL side of it so let's go ahead and cancel this this is what we're going to be using and this is how we created our database um, and one thing to note is that when you by default open the um, DB browser for SQLite things might be very very small for you and the reason for that is because of um, the screen resolution so what you have to do to fix that is go to your preferences under the general you can change the font size so when I had this it was I believe um, this small which is kind of I mean you can still see it but it's a little too small for me so you can go ahead and change that there's uh, other preferences you can go here so for the database you can change the font size or the DB browser, you can change it for the SQL. Uh, there's a bunch of options here that you can use. So that's basically what we use to create our SQL uh, light for Northwind, and that's what we're going to be using. And we have only one table. So if we go to our uh, SQL server under region, we have this same table, but it has more data here. So that's what we're going to be showing our examples uh, for. So now that we created our data stores, uh, the next thing is to actually go to the dependencies and import a package. So we have the system.data.sql client, but we also have the Microsoft Data SQL Lite. Uh, that's a, you just have to go to your packages um, and click uh, browse and search for the package you want. And in our case, we search for the Microsoft.data.sql and install that. So if you go see what is installed, you can see the versions uh, that are that we have. So now that you have that, the next thing is to have a reference, um, having a using statement to the Microsoft.data SQLite. And then in our code, the first thing you do is you basically register the factories. So when you say register and then you're giving it a, a name and we have the SQL client factory instance and then we have the SQLite factory instance. Now that we've created the factory instances, next, uh, basically we tell it which provider to use from this registration. So we go to the DB factory and we say get a factory and passing a name. So out of these registered factories, we're asking for the SQL client. And it returns a DB provider factory. And this is going to be our SQL client factory because that's what we asked for. Now that we have this, we can actually create a connection, get a SQL connection string and assign it, and then open it, create a command, and do everything else we have to. So let's go ahead and see this in action with the SQL client data. Then if we run our program, so now you can see that we successfully went and got the data from SQL Server. So now we'll go ahead and stop this. And this time let's actually go to SQLite. So let's copy that. So now we're telling it to use the SQL Lite factory. And let's execute our code. And let's look at our data table. And sure enough, we have the same data, but this time this is coming from the SQLite. But notice that we didn't do anything uh, different within our code here. All we did was ask for a provider, and then we didn't have to modify our code. So will this work all the time? It will, but the thing is that you have to be careful with the select statements or inserts or updates because uh, different providers have different types of uh, T-SQL uh, rules in there and there might be a little differences so it may not work in every scenario. So you can actually create a factory for your T-SQL as well based on what you passed it here then you can get ver the very specific command and that should work for you. So that's it for this tutorial. Thank you so much for viewing this and we'll see you on the next one.